Thank you very much for the kind invitation and the opportunity to share my experience. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to London uh, on behalf of the BRS, and I hope you have a, a educationally and socially a great experience. So I was listening to Jean talking about 10 years' experience, and I can see why I'm here now, because I've I've been probably doing this for about 18 years, and I'm probably becoming the dinosaur, which I didn't realize before. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you, in this endoscopic area, you've seen people do some amazing stuff. Is there still a room for, or a place for open approaches? Um, my disclosures. So when we talk about open approaches, you can talk about transfacial, osteoplastic flap, or obliterative procedures. And today I'm really going to concentrate on osteoplastic flap because we don't have really time to cover all those areas. So osteoplastic flap has probably been well established for over 80 years and was the workhorse of management of frontal sinus surgery, went into disrepute for many good reasons, has been overtaken by all endoscopic procedures. But in this current era, how do we see the role of something like that? I think the first thing I'd like to emphasize is that the approach, whether it's endoscopic or it's an open approach, osteoplastic flap or transfacial, is an approach. It's not an operation. Um, and it's the way of getting the most suitable access to the pathology you're dealing with. And it is the pathology and the anatomy that determines the approach and the kind of operation you need to do. So we've seen the classification of the types of different types of drafts you will create, the type, the big or a small hole are you going to create. That's the operation. The approach, whether you're taking it endonasally or open, is a different question. And what factors will determine which kind of approach we take. And there's a huge number of factors that you would look at when you decide on which approach and which operation is appropriate for the candidate in front of you. And these are anatomical or they're pathological. And I'm not going to go through all of these as such, but it kind of summarizes my philosophy of the things I would look at when I'm deciding Am I going to do this endonasally or externally? And how big an opening do I need to create to address this anatomy and this pathology? There is, interestingly, uh, since 1991, when uh, modified Lothrop procedure was described, increasingly now we have publications talking about the role of external approaches. And here is one of the publications from Kennedy's group where they looked at their experience um, and they found that 5% of their uh, um, approaches were still external. And the commonest indication was neosteogenesis, osteitis, osteogenesis, whatever you may wish to call it. Uh, and 62% of them were obliterated. I wouldn't agree with the obliteration, but it does highlight the fact that in most hands, this an open approach, an osteoplastic approach, still remains a valid way. And this is for inflammatory disease that we're going to look at. I'd like to share some examples of why I think still remains a valid disease. So here we have a, uh, a pacification of both frontal sinuses with a moderately lateral component, which we've seen can be very adequately addressed. But then as you go back, you start getting into a significant supraorbital component. So you've got the dehiscence into the, into the orbit, you've got dehiscence or at least thinning probably of the posterior plate. It's unlikely it's dehiscent, uh, but you know that the orbit is dehiscent. But you still have a pathology that progresses further back. And although we can access this through an endonasal approach, can we be certain that that pathology will remain drained two years, three years down the line? Because that has to drain through the frontal sinus down into the midline. 
Another example here where somebody with uh, pansinusitis, profuse polyposis, has had 14 procedures already, and the reason they were sent were because they had this lateral pathology, whereby you obviously have dehiscence, but then you have something unusual happening lateral to the orbit. And yes, we can approach across quite a bit, but when we're trying to approach this pathology through an endonasal approach, even if it's transeptal, your corridor is very narrow. And when you are uncertain of what that pathology may be, then I would think there's still a significant role for an external approach. Here we confirm that it's likely to be a mucosal, though uh, so it's reassuring that this is nothing sinister, but in my hands, to me, this is an indication for an osteoplastic flap. And this is what we achieve afterwards, that to be able to drain this cavity into the midline, you need to make sure that you've got clearance. And in my hands, I find that that's really accessible and achievable through an open approach. This is this gentleman here. Although he's bald, if you actually, the only thing that you really thinking about, what are you sacrificing? You're sacrificing an incision, and you're sacrificing the potential risk of loss of the frontal plate. And touch wood in my hands, in six, 18 years, I haven't yet lost one. But if you appropriately make the incisions closure, you won't get any signs of where you've been. Um, neostogenesis. We talked about this. This is anybody doing frontal sinus surgery. This is the devil. This is the, the, the pathology that really makes your life difficult. This is what makes it uh, challenging to try and manage this. And this individual has obviously had previous surgery, has had got some stents in situ, uh, but it's clear that you, they're not going to really create a tract by putting stents unless you deal with that. In my hands, I would approach that through an external approach because you want to give that person a one definitive procedure for them to stop having to have recurrent surgical interventions. A similar kind of case here, and two difficult problems in my hands. These are the things that really challenge me. Neostogenesis, when you get all this newborn forming between yourself and your pathology, and supraorbital pathology. So we've got a supraorbital mucosal, which is obstructed because it's draining into the frontal sinus, which can't drain medially, and that supraorbital mucosal will not be adequately draining medially. So in this kind of situation where the individuals had previous surgery as well, as is evident, I would use an open approach. Another case of neoestrogenesis and osteomyelitis, I would use an open approach. This is the enemy. This is osteoplastic flap approach, and you can see a normal frontal plate, and you see the side with the osteomyelitis or neosteogenesis, osteitis, whatever you wish to call it. But you have to get rid of that disease if you are going to get any resolution of the inflammatory condition and adequate drainage to occur. And that's what I would do. And you can see that essentially that heals extremely well. But it gives you the, that is an approach. This is the operation. This is how I'm ensuring that that sinus is going to drain adequately. So it's the draft three is the operation. The end osteoplastic flap is the approach. Other areas where I think it's still have a significant role is when you talk about osteomas, and especially when you talk about grade three and four osteomas. And I know there are schools who will approach this endoscopically all the time. In my hands, to me, it is an approach. And if the pathology is a grade three or four osteoma, like this one, where it's occupying the whole of the frontal sinus, I'm not certain that actually spending a lot of time drilling from below and uh, is actually to the patient's advantage. It's easier for me to do a three, four hour procedure, come from above, clear the pathology, and make sure we've got the access to be able to remove the osteoma, completely establish adequate drainage inferiorly, and put our <coughs> flap together. 
And osteomas can also, uh, you can approach them endonasally, uh, but sometimes some of them are really difficult to get at. And here you can see that there is a, a previously attempted approach to try and get this osteoma out, which has a significant supraorbital component, but the bone is extremely thick. And yes, you could spend a lot of time drilling that, but is that the right procedure for the individual? In my opinion, this is the kind of individual I would consider an external or an osteoplastic approach. When you've got an osteoma, which is doing something very different, and if you follow it backwards, and it's got this significant sharp supraorbital component going into the intracranial cavity, I think I would use an external approach here. So another very large giant osteoma, that supraorbital again, in my hands, I would prefer to use an external approach to manage these conditions. Um, another example of an individual with a large osteoma with a mucosal lateral to that, and to be adequately be certain you're going to be able to get long-term drainage for that mucosal into the nasal cavity, I feel osteoma, this would be the right approach to have. Last thing, I think, and that's already been mentioned, is the complications of inverted papilloma in the frontal sinus. And in my hands, and with my experience in the past where you always learn from one, your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes more than you learn from your successes. And one of my patients where I tried, attempted multiple occasions, now I have a very low threshold for recurrent inverted papilloma in the frontal sinus, which invariably tends to be multifocal, especially if they've got large sinus cavities. And once you start getting that kind of osteotic changes, in a patient with inverted papilloma that's going in the supraorbital plane, you really best serve the patient with an open approach and ensure you get the tumor out and make sure that you've got adequate control of this possibly quite aggressive disease in this area. So in my hands, I would suggest that remember, an osteoplastic plaque is just an approach, it's not an operation. And what you're trying to do is identify the most suitable access uh, for that. And think about the pathology and the anatomy. And that makes your decision on whether you want to do an endonasal or an open or external approach, uh, or you're going to, and what size of drainage that you need to create. So in summary, I feel in my hands and in my experience, these are the conditions where I would use an osteoplastic approach, inflammatory disease with the supraorbital, oh, apologies, lateral to the orbit, neosteogenesis, grade three, four osteomas, especially if they have significant cranial uh, compression or involvement and inverted revision or recurrent inverted papillomas in the frontal sinus. Thank you very much.